Who's the customer? How do we reach them? How do we engage them? And what are the best channels to get them to actually purchase product from? That was the impetus for a query and what led me down the path of where we are today. Welcome to the B2B Breakthrough Podcast. We're here to bring you all the best knowledge, insights, and strategies from e-commerce experts, successful business owners, and the team at Alibaba.com that you'll need to grow your business and achieve your next big breakthrough. I'm your host, Sharon Guy. That was Samir Balwani, a visionary in the realm of e-commerce and digital marketing. He's the CEO of Query, a media agency dedicated to turbocharging the growth of direct-to-consumer and e-commerce brands. His agency's unique approach, blending full-funnel advertising with rigorous ad experimentation, has propelled countless brands to new heights. Welcome to the show, Samir. Thanks for having me. So you were originally at Amex working with many different brands. And then what exactly made you want to transition into building your own agency? So I was at American Express. I was running brand strategy there. Uh, And previous to that, I was at an agency working on LVMH. So I've had a chance to work on a lot of different brands and experience everything that people have seen and do. My time at Amex was amazing. I would never trade it for anything in the world, but it gave me an opportunity to understand how small businesses think, what it takes for them to get to mid-size market, and then what mid-size does well to turn into enterprise. And so I took that learning and what I had seen there and realized I could apply it to other brands and help them scale on the consumer side. And so that's how Query was born. We're a media buying agency helping support mid-sized consumer brands really grow and scale their brands. We're doing that through media buying and media consulting. So that's everything from who's the customer, how do we reach them, how do we engage them, and what are the best channels to get them to actually purchase product from. That was the impetus for a query and what led me down the path of where we are today. So you're spending points on your credit card and then you can trade in a cash back with a certain brand. Was that the way that you were interacting with the brands or how was Amex working with these brands? My role specifically was overarching brand strategy. So where does Amex sit in the ecosystem? How do you engage with the business? How do you actually see us appear? So everything from colors to campaign taglines to name of credit cards, all of that kinds of stuff. That's the world that I worked in. And so I had the opportunity to really be thoughtful around a media campaign. What's the messaging? Who's the customer? Why are we out there doing the work that we do? And how do we actually best communicate it? So when we talk brand strategy, that's kind of what we're talking about. Was there a certain moment in your career or project that made you realize that going into the media agency world was the right next step? I've had such a great opportunity to be a part of so many really big conversations. So while I was at Amex, I had the opportunity to be part of the team that was working on rebranding their B2B business. And in that time, I would sit around a table with some of the best agencies out there and watch how they would work and realized that Fortune 500s have this unique opportunity to create a round table of the smartest minds in their specific fields. So we would have a creative person, we'd have a media person, we'd have an analytics agency, and these three coming together created these discussions and conversations that led to some of the best work that I've seen come out. And that's when I realized that this is something a lot of mid-sized businesses don't have access to because there aren't a lot of great subject matter experts, a lot of agencies that say, hey, this is our lane. This is what we do well. We're going to stick to it and we're going to continue to iterate and innovate. And instead, at the mid-market stage, what we see a lot of agencies do is say, hey, we do media. Great. That's what we do today. Tomorrow, we're going to do SEO and dev and creative. And now we're a full service agency. And the downside to that is the agency doesn't do all of it well. It does it okay, but they're not really an expert in any one of those areas. And so they can't help elevate the conversation to a new stage. And so that's where we said, we're going to stick to media and media consulting. We're going to become the best at this and we'll help work with other agencies that are the best in their trade. So we partner with a lot of creative agencies to really understand how do we bring the best creative to life? How do we actually bring this messaging into a new way? And that tension between the media agency and the creative agency, where the creative agency is saying, hey, this is a really cool ad we want to put out there. We love this message and the media agent saying, saying, we need to place it in these places and we need it to drive this kind of conversion. That conversation and that tension leads to amazing brand creative that actually drives conversions. Do you have any examples of when you work with such a creative agency where you were able to bounce off of each other and push each other to be better? 
Yeah, our engagements with Peak Design, we partner with a creative agency called Vulgar, and it's awesome. We work with them pretty regularly, and for Peak, we actually were able to create an amazing brand campaign. Peak's culture and aesthetic is its own already. They bring something amazing to the table to start with, and then it's our job to kind of take it to the next level, and that's what we did with Peak. We created a Reddit campaign that went crazy, and they've seen some amazing campaign results ever since. You created a Reddit campaign for Peak Design? How did that work? So we launched an awesome ad campaign on YouTube and Reddit. So it was a 360 campaign. The two big placements for this campaign specifically were a YouTube takeover and a Reddit takeover. And we had the opportunity to do that. And so when we talk about pushing creative teams to come up with really interesting creative for really unique ad placements, this was one of those. How do you create a really aesthetically pleasing and compelling ad creative for a platform that's usually text-based and conversational and community-driven. And my team and Vulgar really worked together to make that come to life and did a great job at it. We'll definitely dive into peak design more extensively in a little bit. But before that, in the beginning stages of building up your business, was it really difficult? Did you just have a lot of clout built up from the time that you were at Amex? So you just hit day one with many different customers and people waiting in a queue to work with you? Or was it slow to get off the ground? What were the first couple of days like? It was slow. It was difficult. I wouldn't have had it any other way because I think it builds resilience. When I first started, I left my job at American Express and decided that I would email every single person I know and let them know that I had started an agency or I was consulting at the time, that I was freelancing at the time, and I would help support anybody that they knew and just ask for recommendations and introductions. A few weeks later, I had my first one or two clients. That's the beauty of a service business, though. <laughs> I don't have to buy inventory. I don't have to do design work. I just need a name and my brain, and we can kind of get started there. But becoming a freelancer is pretty straightforward and simple, and I feel like the accounting and legality side was more work than getting the client. The contract? Contracts, forming your LLC, having all that in place setting up an accounting platform so that you know how to get paid. Where do you get paid? All of that kinds of work was a lot, especially because what I didn't want to have happen was work, 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 and then get hit with a tax bill and realize that I have to pay all this taxes and stuff. So I was very thoughtful about setting up my infrastructure to begin with as soon as I got my first client. When we first started, I was focused more on startup brands because I thought that's where I could be the most impactful as a single person. So I was helpful, and it's interesting, nowadays we call them fractional CMOs. That was pretty much my role. I was helping our brand founders really think through their marketing, how do they build a team, what their org design should look like, how do they bucket and forecast budget, and then actually activating some of their marketing. Who was your first customer? A long time ago, I worked with a brand. The brand is called P448. They're a sneaker brand. Are they still around? Oh, yeah, they're still around. Italian sneakers, a gentleman named Wayne Culkin launched them. He's the former president and CEO of Stuart Weitzman. It is an awesome brand. It is such a cool product. Ben and I are still friends. I actually just had him on my podcast a few weeks ago, and we had a great conversation. The podcast I run is called Ecom Experiences, and it's an opportunity to talk to brand founders and marketing leaders around their just experience getting into ecom and what it like looks like. And so it was great to hear from his perspective, someone that started at store, ran that business for so long, to then come back to a net new brand from the ground up where ecom now is such a big piece of the business versus when he had started, it wasn't. And so he's gone through helping a brand transition from into e-com and now starting a brand from e-com. And that conversation was really great. I loved it. They're an awesome brand. You mean when he worked at Stuart Weitzman and then he set up the e-com side for them. And then after that, he stepped out and then came up with his own brand. I think starting a brand, it's an amazing experience that I think everybody should try. You learn so much about yourself in that process and the things that you're passionate about. If you go into it thinking it's going to be the next million dollar business, it probably won't be. But if you go into it thinking, I have this really interesting brand and I want to try it as a passion project and I'm going to dedicate X dollars to it. I'm going to do this myself. I think there's value in doing that because as a marketer, as a founder, that's when you learn the most. It's just by doing and trying. So I think that that was a great experience. So you helped him in the early days to set up his brand, P448. 
Yeah, so I was brought in as a consultant to help with all their paid media. So we ran all their search, social, display ads at the time for the brand. So we worked with them for a while, and then at one stage, they grew, and I had brought on a few other clients. So we hit this tipping point where I either had to stop saying yes to clients and start to say, you know what, you're getting too big, I need to move you elsewhere, or I had to bring on staff. And it was at that moment that we transitioned from this is just a freelance consultancy to, all right, we're an agency and I brought on staff. Was it like a number of hours worked in a week and then you were just like, I'm burning out, so that's why I need to bring somebody in? Or was it like a revenue point that is a tipping point where you're like, oh, so now I have this extra cash to hire somebody new? Because we talk to so many different entrepreneurs, founders, and everybody's tipping point is different. And everyone is always wondering, what is the point that I should be hiring for extra help? Because what I have done alone has been successful enough where I'm going from a one man, one woman show into a company. So on the services side, it's a unique decision because I actually don't think it's revenue or time based. It's entirely mental. And it was a mental decision that I wanted to, because you will hit a fork in the road and you will say, hey, I want to continue being an independent consultant. And so the beauty of being a services-based business is my money and time are tied together. And so I can go to a client and say, hey, my rates are increasing because we have so much demand for work. I'm going to charge you this. And so we can increase our rates to maintain my hours. But you only have 40 hours of work a week. And if you're an independent consultant, 10 of those hours need to be dedicated to networking and new business. So really you only have 30 hours of work that you can do. And so there's a cap at how much you can charge and then how much you can make. And so you come to a decision of, is this a lifestyle that I want to maintain? And I'm going to do this consulting for a number of years. I'm going to make X amount of dollars. And this is what my world is going to look like. Or is it why I'm going to start building a team out? I'm going to turn this into an asset and become something five years down the line, 10 years down the line. And so that's why I say it's this like mental decision where you have to decide which route you want to go down. And so I decided, you know what, I'm going to turn this into an agency because I want to actually service as many brands as possible. I don't want to be stuck in, I'm servicing P3 and that's the max I can do because that's the max I can offer. And so we went down the hiring staff and building a team out. That's been the start of things. And you asked me what the hardest stage is, and I laugh because the beginning is hard, and then hiring is hard, and then today is hard. And I think if you are afraid of hard, being a business owner is probably not the right spot for you because every day is a different challenge. Every day is a different thing. You're just constantly problem solving is what your role becomes. I also recently stepped away from the traditional corporate nine to five into doing my own thing. And I felt two big differences. One is when you are on your own, the income salary you can make for yourself, the sky is the limit versus I think in a traditional nine to five, it's always capped with something. And then I think the second big thing, I don't know if you empathize or agree with, is prioritization. Because when you have a reporting line or somebody to report into, there's just things that you just know what to prioritize first to complete the job. But when you are on your own, that landscape is completely for you to design. Like you want to do networking in the next hour, go ahead and do it. You want to do actual work the next hour, go ahead and do that. But should you do that first or should you do that second? In what order do you do things? Or even what activities should you be doing on a day-to-day -day basis? It's completely up to you to design. I think it goes even beyond just like the work you do. Your personal life feeds into it too. You want to go to lunch with a friend? Go for it. But that gets into your priorities list then, right? Did I want to get this client deliverable out today? Did I want to finish that marketing campaign or did I want to work out? To your point, prioritization at a business owner level, work-life balance takes on a whole new meaning and becomes even more important from that perspective. So it's kind of like if you are working for yourself, you should have total work-life balance because you're deciding to insert that gym hour in the middle of the day. And yet I hear so many business owners say my work-life balance is even at a worse spot than when I did that corporate job. You know why? It's because the nine to five is great. 
I did it for a long time. It is a steady job. You know, you get paid. You are not up at night worried about, am I going to make payroll? Am I going to pay myself? Do I have enough money? Where is my next client coming from? What's our next sale coming from? All that kind of stuff. You're not thinking about that. But it also means that you don't get to enjoy the rewards of extreme success. And so what ends up happening is a lot of business owners don't do work-life balance because you're always chasing the fact that if I finish this, if I get this, I get one step closer. And it's a very one-to-one -one feel. I go to a networking call. I might close another deal. I go work out. I take care of myself. I'd rather go close the other deal. And so it's like a bad prioritization mentally. And so you do have to like force guardrails for yourself. And it is a key piece of it. But I think about it as like a sine wave, right? So you have high and low amplitude. And when you work a nine to five, you have highs, you have lows, but they're kind of like a little muted of a sine wave. And then you become a manager. Your sine wave gets a little bit higher because now you're like a VP. There's more responsibilities. The highs are a little higher because you're getting the benefits of it and the lows of it. And then you become a business owner and you get to enjoy the highest of highs and the lowest of lows. And so having that resilience to manage through is definitely key. So while we joke about work-life balance and like taking care of yourself being a thing that people don't prioritize, I actually think the best business owners do prioritize it because they recognize that managing through those lows and managing through those highs requires your body and mind to be in a healthy state to be able to actually manage through it. But I'll tell you, once you do experience those high highs and low lows, that sensation, that feeling, that excitement it's so hard to go back. And it's why you hear so many business owners that once they start, they say, I can never work for anyone else. It's that level of freedom and responsibility that's really unique to the role and the job that you do. I think for a lot of people, they're hesitating to take that leap too. Can we talk a little bit about what you just said, which is your lowest of low and your highest of high? What were both of those points for you? I also like to think that business owners have a broken compass when it comes to optimism and that they just believe optimistically no matter what. So transparently and very candidly, I can't think of a lowest of low. And that may just be like a psychological saving grace of making sure that you don't experience it. I mean, we've had some hard months where we've had to close deals. Cash flow is always a conversation. How are we investing our dollars? There's always that. We'll lose clients, and that always sucks, but it is what it is. I'd say highest of highs is definitely hiring my first employee and seeing that stage happen. I had put out a goal that I wanted to be on the Inc. 5000, hitting that target was a huge opportunity and a huge win. When did you set that goal? Was it year one? So five years ago, I said, it will feel really good if we hit the Inc. 5000. Like one day or within a certain deadline? One day. It was just like this target. I don't even know why. It was just this like random thing. I probably was reading the paper and I was just like, you know what? This is the target. And so when that happened, while I don't know like why I chose it, it felt great. And so I was really excited about that. And it was an awesome opportunity. So those are probably some big highs. I mean, our team is pretty large now. I'm really excited about that. Whenever we do an annual retreat, because we're all remote, when we all get together and I see everyone, those are really big highs because you're surrounded by some of the smartest people and I'm constantly learning from them. And that is a lot of fun. Who did you first hire? What was your method behind hiring? So I hired a gentleman as a media buyer to help me just actually get like the work done. That's where I needed support was just like hands on keyboard actually doing some work. And he is awesome. I actually still work with him, which is amazing. So he came in as a referral, actually. Someone had recommended it. And it's interesting because being a small business owner and hiring, coming from a company like Amex, where I had so many resources and a full HR team to vet and manage and core values and culture and everything as a scorecard, to have to build all of that. And I'll be honest, we didn't have it for our first round. We didn't have a scorecard. We didn't have culture, core values. That all built up over time as we continued to grow. I recognized the importance of it because I saw the impact it had while I was at American Express. And so it was a priority, but on day one, we definitely didn't have those pieces in place. Do you have any tips or advice to other founders or entrepreneurs in hiring? Because everyone scratches their head over, where do I find talent? But more specifically, where do I find talent that is right for me? I have a lot of advice on that one. So I think it depends on stage of the business. And I think a lot of founders fail 
or struggle hiring their first employee, not because the employee isn't good, but they're not ready to be a manager. We've all experienced the micromanager. When you are the owner of the business and you think every decision is going to ruin your business, you micromanage even more. And what ends up happening is you stifle a lot of really smart people. So I think as a business owner, it is really hard to let go and get out of the way. And that is something you have to do. So I think first few employees, definitely referrals, people that you know, people that you can trust because you want your culture to fit and you want them to be a personality fit. And then you're going to figure the rest of that together. And so you want people that are problem solvers or that are smart that can help you really understand and build your internal processes, build what your team is going to look like. Because early on, your roles are very amorphous and general and everyone is like all hands on deck. As you grow, you'll start to have departments and true subject matter experts at that point. And I think at that stage, it's a, a different hiring mentality and hiring method. At that point, we do have the LinkedIn recruiter where we are banging the trees, trying to get people in, have like a, a full interview process. But early days, we didn't have any of that. Switching gears a bit to what you do every day, working with e-commerce brand owners, what do you see that these brand owners mostly struggle with when it comes to paid media? Because I'd imagine that usually when you build up a brand, even the P448 brand, he probably had his own e-commerce team and somebody was a paid media strategist within that team whose job was to design the strategy and maybe budget out how much to spend per channel, measure returns, ROAS. And then now you've worked with so many different cases and brands. What do you normally see when somebody is coming to you? What are they struggling with? Almost always the struggle is either scale or efficiency. And sometimes it's both. So a lot of our brands are trying to grow appropriately. You want to make money as you grow. It's not helpful to just grow and lose money as you continue to grow. So that's usually the problem that we're dealing with. And to your point, a lot of the brands that we work with have a marketing manager on their end who's helping build the strategy and who's helping build the forecasting. Most of the time, our team manages all of that. We get inputs from the brand, but we're building out the media strategy. We're building out the actual forecast and what channels we're going to invest in. And so they're really leaning on us to come back with our expertise to help them build all of that out. What I would say is when we're talking about scale and efficiency, especially these days with what the largest problem a lot of these brands have, they are really focused on how do you build brand awareness while still driving revenue for the business? So how do you introduce the brand to new customers, new consumers, get in front of them, engage with them, and then ultimately convince them to purchase? A lot of paid media and media has been focused on the bottom of the funnel. I know this person is ready to purchase. Let's get them to the site. Let's get them to purchase. And while that is still important, there's so much competition at that stage these days. There's so many new brands. There's so many channels for advertising. It's where everyone spends all their money. So helping brands really think, okay, well, how do we maintain that and maximize our impacts there, but also reach customers earlier on in their purchasing path? So that way we don't have to compete so much on the bottom because they're already aware of who we are and they already want to engage with our brand and it's an easier sell when they see us. And so helping our brands really understand that process and how to measure it and how to think about it as an investment and show the impacts of it, that's where we spend most of our time. I know there's a saying within the marketing world that you have to have nine touch points with that customer until they are in the end converting. But in the initial brand awareness building part, would that be the first four to five touch points where you're building that brand awareness? So it's interesting. I love the nine touch points saying, because when I first started in marketing, it was three touch points and now it's nine touch points. And I like to say that it's probably even more than that. So we like to do a lot of top of funnel, a lot of introduction to the brand because you don't know when somebody is ready to purchase. And so until they raise their hand and create a behavior that allows them to want to purchase, but they can't really raise their hand and do that if they aren't engaging with your brand. So I think once you're in the buying cycle, it'll take nine touches 
to actually get you to purchase. But even before that, how do you even just get into someone's consideration set? I'm going to buy a new pair of shoes. How do you make sure that P448 sneakers is even a part of that conversation? Are there certain SaaS tools that you're using on a day-to-day basis to measure that where you know that you are, first of all, talking to a sneaker enthusiast? And then how do you measure the touch points that you have with this person? So what we'll do is we actually create a unique strategy for each one of our clients. So we'll create what's called a measurement framework where we'll actually create a plan of how we're going to measure each stage of the business and the touch points across each one of those. So at the highest level, we're doing a brand health tracker or brand study to really understand, all right, well, are we gaining market share? Do people even know about us? And if that comes back of like, I've never heard of this brand before, then that's an opportunity for us to continue to advertise to that market and to grow it. At the business level, we're talking about, all right, well, how many people are coming to our site? How many wholesale partners do we have? What does our engagement there look like? And creating KPIs to measure there. And then, of course, on the business outcome standpoint, it's what's our revenue growth? What's our return on ad spend? What's our marketing returns? And making sure that all of those together help us triangulate what's working and what's not working. In terms of are we reaching the right audience or not, we're really monitoring a lot of the KPIs as we do through our campaigns. So a really easy one of are we reaching the right audience or not is do people care about the ads that you're putting out there? So if I put an ad out, to an audience and they don't click at it, they don't engage with it. And so that may not be clicking on it, but that may even just be like viewing it. That is an indicator to me that either the audience isn't a right audience or the creative isn't engaging enough. We can diagnose from there. But for a lot of these upper funnel campaigns, awareness campaigns, it is more diagnostic of a metric versus, hey, I put a dollar in and I saw that that platform said I had a row as of X. And so I think that's why a lot of brands struggle with that investment because we have been spoiled by performance marketing of a very clear outcome for the dollars that we put in. But everybody invests only in those channels. Competition makes it impossible to scale, as well as the fact that nobody knows who your brand is. And so you'll hit a plateau and it becomes hard to break through that. Any tools that you're using on a day-to-day basis to measure how well these brands are doing? There's no singular tool that we use. It's really more a mixture of a lot of tools. So we'll use marketing mix modeling for our clients. We'll use some incrementality testing for our clients. And again, it like really depends on the client which tool makes the most sense for them, what data they have access to, what's their scale. And so that's why I say there's no singular tool, but these are the things that we're trying to solve for. And then multi-touch attribution, which is another piece of the puzzle for us. On your website, and I've also heard in previous podcasts, you've talked extensively about Peak Design. Can you share with us what exactly you did with them, what they were like when you first met them, and then what happened with them? When we first started engaging with them, we were brought on to help organize and streamline their paid media. And so they had tried it. They were excited about it. They knew it was a piece of the puzzle, but they just couldn't get it to a stage where it was actually growing their business. They had kind of hit that plateau. So we joined with them and were able to really help unlock a lot of the organizational tools they needed. So that way we could start scaling them. So helping them think through what is the impact on brand? How does every touch point in media be something that helps lift the brand? What are the consumers we're going after? After, how are we engaging with them, partnering really closely with their creative agency to make sure that we are getting the right creative for the ad placements that we have. When we took over their business, it was already an awesome business growing really well. And we helped unlock some more growth on the e side, which was seen on the e side, but then also across their wholesale partners as well. I know in previous podcasts, you mentioned a lot about community building. What are some strategies that e-com brands can do to build that community? I think the first step for community building is having a point of view. What does your brand stand for? What are your brand values? Who would be a part of your community? And then being true to it. So Peak Design is a great example of this one, too. So they are very true to who their customer is. Their culture internal is the same culture that they put external. It's fun. It's exciting. It's design forward. It's thoughtful. And they just have a great time. So that shows up in their social media. It shows up in their internal meetings. It shows up in kind of the advertising that we do. And so people naturally congregate around them and are excited for them and become brand loyalists. And so the best brands have realized that. 
how do you build that brand following that community around you where people are excited about talking about you or excited to tell their friends about you? Because that's what helps you continue to grow. If you don't have that core customer that loves you and is excited and is helping you grow your community, well, then you're just acquiring a new customer. They're looking at your product like a commodity and then leaving. And they're not going to be excited when you launch a new product line or have a new category launch. They're not going to help build your base. And so that's why I say for a lot of brands, having that foundational community is key for growing and reaching any new stages of growth. How do you manage that community? Is it the Instagram page, Facebook page? I think it's broader than just community from a traditional sense of like, I've got a website and there's people on this and this is how I engage with them. It's not my Facebook following. It's more omni-channel than that. It is your Instagram following, your TikTok following, the ratings and reviews that you have. If you have a membership program, it's the people in your membership program. But it's also just looking into your CRM and saying, hey, this customer bought from me 10 times. He's part of my community. Okay, let's pull together all of my top customers. That's my community. Those are the people that care about you, that are excited about you, that want to see you succeed because they're brand loyalists. And so you want to look and say, is that number growing? How are we engaging those people? What are we doing to make them feel like they're part of the community? And how are we just being true to them? So we've talked to Entreprenista in the past, who is a founder who manages her own community of women. And the way that she does it is she brings some of her following or members to a specific platform where they get to know each other and they can interact with each other. Is that something that, from an e-com brand perspective, that you can also do? Or what are the ways that you can engage with this group of people more? It is a matter of figuring out where your customer and your community likes to engage. So one of the hard parts about moving someone from one community to another is they may not want to. And so I'm of the mindset of finding where your community is and engaging with them there. If your community is on Instagram, great. Then Instagram is the channel that you need to be on. If they're on TikTok, awesome. TikTok is where you're going to be, and you're going to be spending time there. So I think it's a matter of really understanding who your customer is and where they are engaging and then being a part of that conversation. I do love the idea of having a community for your VIPs. I think membership programs are really valuable as more retailers are building their own membership programs and like direct-to-consumer brands really needing to own that customer as well. So loyalty programs, membership programs are valuable. I think there's also value in doing offline events. I think if you have an event and do a dinner or do a product unveiling, a product feedback. These are your VIPs that want to be a part of the brand. They feel invested in it. Help them help you is kind of my thought process. So however you can engage them, whether it be through email or send a handwritten note or just even acknowledge who they are is a valuable way of engaging with them. Do you see any trends happening in the paid media space? Yeah, I think the current trend right now is around measurement and just knowing that measurement is going to become harder. People really thinking through what does it mean to have a good return on ad spend? How do we measure return on ad spend? And is my media actually working? And the reason why measurement is going to become harder is there's a lot of privacy initiatives in the U.S. that are coming out. California has done, Colorado, Virginia, and that's made it a lot harder to actually track our results. And so we are reliant on a lot of different tools to help triangulate what's working and what's not working. I'm optimistic about the outcomes of it because I actually think that the difficulty in measurement will allow us to actually do more brand campaigns because if performance marketing is difficult to measure, then at least now I can go to a client and say, hey, let's do full funnel because it's all difficult to measure and we're going to have to measure it as a whole anyway. And it's better for your business. So that gives us like an opportunity from that perspective to actually really think about the entire customer journey instead of just the end of it. And I think will lead to better outcomes for businesses. So in recent years, I've heard that a lot of brands have shifted a lot of their marketing budget from the Facebook or meta world into TikTok. And then with what's happening right now in the news with TikTok being potentially banned, what are your thoughts there in how that will impact all of these brands that have now these huge budgets to spend on TikTok? 
my team's making plan A, plan B, and plan C just in case. I'm really hopeful, and I don't think anything will come of it. It is a slippery slope if it does. And so we do allocate budgets elsewhere. We're also transparent with the clients around the fact that for a lot of our clients, TikTok is a really good channel. It's very effective. It does great work. And so if we have to transfer to another channel, we may not see the same returns that we're seeing or the same results that we're seeing. And so they just need to be prepared for that. Do you think people will shift back to Instagram? Where will that money go? I think a portion of it will probably shift back. I don't think all of it will. And the reason why is because Meta as a platform just wouldn't be able to absorb all those dollars. It's one thing to say, I've got X dollars for TikTok and Y dollars for Facebook. My return is A and B. Let's move it because I'm comfortable with B return. But it's going to be you and every other brand. So Meta as a whole will see higher competition also. So the returns that you're getting today won't be the returns you get tomorrow when the price for advertising goes up as well because more people are moving money into Meta. So I think some of the money will move, but clients will need to and brands will need to think about where else does this dollar go? I can tell you from our perspective, some of it won't stay in media. We'll recommend that they actually take the dollars back and put it elsewhere in some other engagement, in some other marketing channel until we can identify another channel similar to TikTok or another media mix that works for them. Because it will be a large amount of money transitioning all over the place. And until we can get an understanding of what that looks like, it'll be a a lot of uncertainty for sure. And maybe brands will need to become even more creative with how to get new customers, keep up customer engagement. It'll be a great opportunity for platforms like Pinterest and Reddit, who are already starting to see some really early results and strength in their platform from an advertising standpoint. We test every platform out there. We do see good results from them. Is it the same results as TikTok? Not really. Is it the same scale as TikTok? Not really. And I say that yet. We don't know what will happen if we double down on those platforms if TikTok goes away and we're forced to. That's a good point, is building that community in Reddit. Because that's not really a mainstream way of building up community just yet. Is it because it's so anonymized in Reddit? So you really don't really know who is interacting with you. What percentage of brands have built up a Reddit community? I don't know the answer to that one, but I know a lot of brands engage with customers on Reddit because there's value in engaging on there. You have to have a really good PR team if you're going to be doing that because you want to make sure that you are managing the conversation well. You understand the nuances and engagement on that channel for sure. So I think brands are nervous about engaging with Reddit because it can absolutely backfire if you're not doing it authentically and well. So to wrap it up, we'll look at what you think the top five trends are in the e-commerce space in 2024, and how do you think brands will prepare and capitalize on these trends? What are you seeing that's new-ish these years that's happening in the world of e-com? So I think in the world of e-com and direct-to-consumer, omni-channel is becoming more important than ever before. So partnering with wholesalers and really getting distribution for your product and brand. The second thing is it's Summer Olympics, which is always an attention grabber, and large brands tend to advertise a lot around the Summer Olympics. So we do see increased competition against our brands as well. And then finally, it's an election year. And so every election year leads to the a record-breaking amount of paid media spend. And so digital advertising gets the brunt of it. It's what's going to happen again this year. And it's going to happen just leading up to Q4 holiday. So for our e-com friends and our consumer brands, it's something to be really thoughtful of, of where are we spending our money? How are we spending our money? Any piece of advice for someone who wants to start out in marketing or e-commerce? If you want to start in marketing e-commerce, just do it. Start your own small brand, choose a product, just get it out there. You can throw up a Shopify site or an Etsy site and just try something out. The amount that you will learn in a few months of doing it will rock your brain. Everything from logistics to product sourcing to Shopify dev. If you have that mentality of I will figure it out, there's nothing better than just trying for a little bit. Thank you so much for being with us. Sharon, this was so much fun. 
B2B Breakthrough is produced by Alibaba.com. To find out how Alibaba.com is empowering its customers with the tools, services, and resources they need to grow their businesses, visit Alibaba.com. And then make sure to search for B2B Breakthrough Podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you find your podcasts. Make sure to follow us so you don't miss future episodes. On behalf of the team here at Alibaba.com, thanks for listening.